me invite you to open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis 22 is where we'll be this morning. If you did not bring a Bible, you might can use uh, your phone uh, and find a Bible because you, you'll need it. You'll always need your Bible at Hickory Grove. Uh, we'll have the verses on the screen, but today's message will be driven by what uh, the Bible teaches us. Now, next week, starting March the 4th and then the 11th and then the 18th, we have a gospel series. Next Sunday, we'll talk about the gospel and race. Uh, the following Sunday will be the gospel and adoption. And then the Sunday after that will be the gospel and money. So you pray that God will be honored in the next three weeks as we talk about the gospel. <clears throat> Billy Graham. Let's talk about Billy Graham a minute. Seen it all over the news and probably on social media, 99 years old. Billy Graham now stands in the presence of Jesus. For us, he defined an era for evangelicals. Counseled every president from Truman all the way up. Truman was the only one that didn't like him. I mean, how, can you imagine not liking Billy Graham? His ministry, all of those years, unstained by scandal. <clears throat> As a preacher, he physically stood in front of upwards of 240 million people and preached the gospel. He stayed in the Lincoln bedroom at the White House more than any other American. He'll, uh, stop, he'll lie in state this week at the Rotunda, at the, at the Capitol, which only four civilians in American history have ever done that. Billy Graham was the first, one of the first ones to cross racial lines when our country had a terrible, hardened, uh, racist approach to life. And he was able to, to cross those. He would not permit there to be a white section and a black section in his crusades. He would stand to give a clear gospel message, always pointing to Christ. Pointing to Christ. It's what I hope to do this morning with Genesis chapter 22. Point you to Christ. We'll read Genesis 22. We read it as history, but we also understand that underneath the history is a clear line from Genesis 22 to the cross of Jesus. And in the next few moments together, I hope to take you across that line to see it. If you found Genesis 22, why don't you stand? We'll read together God's word. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 22, let's begin in verse 1, and we'll read a lengthy passage over to verse 14. Grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Let's begin verse 1. After these things, God tested Abraham. And he said to him, Abraham, and Abraham said, here I am. And he said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains in which I'll tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, he saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and he went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and he saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife, so they went, both of them, together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father! And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and he laid the wood in order and he bound Isaac, his son, laid him on the altar on top of the wood. 
Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said to him, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and he took the ram and he offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is to this day on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Father, I pray that you, by your spirit, take your word to point us clearly to Jesus, your son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Each of you came in this morning, just as I did. Each of you came in this morning with your own concept of who God is and how he works. And in this passage, what we find is some of the most profound concepts about God anywhere in the Bible. In fact, this, this story is more carefully and artistically written than any passage in all of Genesis. What I've just read for you, Genesis 22, what we have here is the greatest, most well-known test of Abraham's long life. It's the last great drama for the old patriarch. And in this drama of God's word, you will find the most important principle in the Bible. It is the principle of atonement. If you want to be smart, you could write down the word substitutionary atonement. This is, in Genesis 22, this is the simple gospel of Jesus that Billy Graham gave his life to and we commit this church to. And that gospel is this, that Jesus died in the place of sinners. Genesis 22 is pageantry and prophecy. It is a prophecy of the actual sacrifice of Jesus. That's in the background. But in the foreground, what we have is a very real historical account. A gut-wrenching story of a man being tested. His faith being tested, his sanity, his, his emotional capacity to, to carry on, test it. Like a lot of you sitting in this sanctuary this morning, test it. This passage points us directly. We, we've got to go directly to Christ. While it does that, when we read it, what we see is Abraham. Abraham shows us the meaning of faith. I'm going to give you a quick definition of faith. Faith is trusting God despite all the evidence to the contrary. Faith, trusting God despite all of the evidence to the contrary. When you read the story, it's written, Moses wrote it in such a way that we would see at every step the love between a father and son. And the love between a father and his son is forced on us so that when we read it, we might feel it. Look, don't be afraid to feel. As a Christian, this is written so that our hearts will beat for the gospel. This is written so that, that we feel the love of a father to a son. So that we might understand the task that is laid on Abraham and what he's got to do. And how hard is that task laid on Abraham should remind some of you of the task laid on you. 
And as impossible as it might sound to you this morning, as impossible as it might actually feel to some of you, this passage is challenging us to do something. This passage is challenging us to hold all other loves, to hold all other persons, to hold all other people, to hold them as less than the love that you have for God. To know that this life is a test. That what, what you're in is a test. And here's the truth that you'll find in the passage. Every test points us to Christ. In fact, I think that's such a, the central theme of this passage. I'm going to make that the one and only point. I'll say it like this. All of our tests point us to Christ. Every one of them. Let's, uh, let's do something a little different. Let's just walk through the passage. We can treat it like a Bible study if you'd like. Let's just walk through the passage. And, uh, and as you do, we'll start in verse 1 of chapter 22. And on the very front end, you'll see it in verse 1. You can read it there. Notice what the text tells us right there in print. Verse 1, God tested Abraham. Just like he'll test you. Like he tests me to develop you. To show you that the pain is there in your life. To show you that his grace is sweet. The struggle is there in your life to show you that freedom in Christ is beautiful. The pain you feel is there so you can realize the love of God is real. So that you can see when you're weak, that's when he's strong. Listen to the sad poetry in verse 2. It's poetry, but it's sad. Listen to how it's written to remind us of the pain involved. Let me read it to you in verse 2. Take now your son, count them, take now your son, your only son that you love, Isaac. Offer him as a burnt offering. Abraham, everything you waited for, everything you believed in, everything you dreamed about, all the promises. Say, Abraham, do you love the gift of Isaac or the giver more? Do you love God or the blessings of God more? Let me put it in a way we can understand. Is, is Christ enough for you? If you have cancer and you're not going to be healed, is Christ enough? If, if you're cheated on and there's no explanation and the bottom drops out in your life, is Christ enough? If you're broke with no money or you fail at something... I'm asking you, is he enough? Are you going to be okay with that? You see, what we feel, you got to feel it. What we feel in the text is the love that Abraham has for his son. And the love that Abraham has for his son reminds us that God the Father loves God the Son, Jesus, infinitely more. Keep that in mind. Let's go back to the story. Abraham gets a call in verse 2 telling him what he has to do. And the next three verses, verse 3, 4, and 5, give us a glimpse at Abraham's faith. I'll show you three kinds of faith. I'll do it quickly. In verse 3, notice his unhesitating, unhesitating faith. Let me read it to you, verse 3. Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and he went to the place which God had told him. Right on the front end of verse three, do you see it? The next day he got up early. Abraham did exactly what God called him to do. Taking a hard obedience and doing it immediately. Doing the difficult thing and doing it without delay. 
The truth is that some of you sitting here this, this morning, you have a, a hard obedience that you know you've got to do. You've been putting it off. You know that it's the right thing to do. It might, it might cost you friends. It might cost you stature. It might even cost you a job or money. And that's why you haven't done it. And the picture we see of his faith is he knew it was a terrible thing to do. Verse 3, got up early in the morning and went to do it. Abraham's faith is unhesitating. I'm asking you to have the kind of faith that prompts you to obey. Verse 4 gives us not just an unhesitating faith, but you'll see in verse 4 a persevering faith. Something that's going to get you to hold on, to hold on, to keep going. Let me read verse 4. On the third day, they traveled three days. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and he saw the place where he's going to have to sacrifice Isaac. He saw it from afar. Three days. Think about it now, traveling. Three days they rode or walked together. <coughs> Ever driven across the country? Three days. He's with his son and two other young men. There's no music. There are no videos to watch. You, they don't even have a phone with a game on it. You know what they had to do? Some of you are old enough to remember this. They had to talk to one another. <laughs> I mean, I'm old enough to remember traveling across the country. I go to see Connie's folks in Mississippi. It's about an 11-hour trip. And the boys, when they were small, it would get a video, one of those big VCR TV built in with a tape and put it in there. I had to strap it down in the car like a giant television just to give them something to do. There's none of that here. Now think about the man Abraham with his son. He, for three days, he's carrying the anxiety of knowing what is waiting on them. Three, three days is an eternity when you're dreading something. You know what this is? This is the faith that keeps you praying as a parent and staying as a spouse. This is the faith that keeps you praying as a parent, staying as a spouse. Look, you don't, who needs faith when the sun is shining? Nobody needs faith when the sun is shining. You need faith when you're walking in the dark. A persevering faith. There's another kind of faith here in the text. I think you'll see it in verse 5. I'm going to call it a saving faith. They get to the spot there in verse 5 and notice what Abraham says in verse 5. It's important to see the language because the writer of Hebrews talks about it. And we'll get to that in just a moment. Verse 5. Abraham said to the young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy, Isaac, I and the boy will go over there and worship and come to you again. He and I will go over there and we both will come back. Now that baffles our minds because we know what God has told him he's got to do. The writer of Hebrews, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, looks back at this passage. And in Hebrews chapter 11, listen to what the writer says. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, he offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promise was in the act of offering up his only son of, when it was said, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered, Abraham did, he considered that God was able, even able to raise him from the dead, from which figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. In other words, he believed God. And that's what I'm asking you to do today. Here's what I'm asking so that we, we can all, so that a child can understand it. I'm asking you today that in your heart, in your heart, make for God, make a throne for him. In your heart, make a throne for God and crown him as king. Crown him as king in your heart and then demand that all the other passions and loves of your life bow down to the ruler. The story continues in verse six. The story flows in verse 6, and there in verse 6, it sets up for us the work of Christ. Verse 6, Abraham, you, you see it, go ahead and look, look at the Bible. Verse 6, Abraham took the word, uh, took the wood of the burnt offering, and he laid it on Isaac, his son. See that in verse 6? 
Jewish commentators, when they looked at this, not even Christian, didn't believe in a Messiah. Jewish commentary would say that, that, that Isaac was like a man with a cross on his back. Isaac carries the wood in verses 6, and then in verses 7 and 8, there's a conversation. You see it in verse 7 and 8? In Hebrew, in the Hebrew language, with this language, which uh, this was written in, in verse 7, there, there's, it's just a six-word question. Look, look at verse 7. Verse 7. Where is the lamb for the burnt offering? You know what that is right there? That is a direct foreshadowing of what John the Baptist would say when he saw Jesus coming. And John the Baptist would say, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. You put the Bible together and what you find out is that God supplies his son instead of requiring Abraham to supply Isaac. Verse 8, you'll notice uh, verse 8 is a great verse. I love verse 8 because it gives the clearest. Verse 8 is the clearest Old Testament answer to God's provision for us at Calvary. Let me read verse 8 for you. Abraham answering Isaac says this. God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. The clearest picture of Calvary. Now the story picks up steam. Verses 9 and 10. Verses 9 and 10, Abraham puts his son of the promise, his son that symbolizes everything, everything that he's lived for, everything that he believes in. He puts him on the altar. Look at verse 10. Then in verse 10, Abraham takes the knife in his hand and raises it above his head and on the way down to kill his son. Abraham is made to realize the intense love that God the Father has for his son Jesus, and yet he did not spare his own son, but gave him up to a death on the cross. And in verse 11 and 12, the angel from heaven speaks to, to Abraham and tells him, don't do it, Abraham. And, and, and then verse 13, read verse 13. Verse 13, there it is. Abraham lifted his eyes, looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. You know what's going on in verse 13? I would circle that verse. There is a vivid representation of the gospel of Jesus a ransom that is found for the doomed and condemned and acceptable substitute is put in the place of the condemned. Honestly, this brings me to how this story directly foreshadows the cross and what actually happened at the cross. To, to say it succinctly and carefully, I'm going to borrow six words that a friend of mine named Jared Wilson put in a list. He did it in a book called Gospel Deeps. And I want to give you the six words that will explain the cross of Christ. Here's the first one. <clears throat> the first word is mediation, mediation, mediation. There is a gulf between us and God. That gulf is filled with the wrath of God that is owed to us for our sin. At the cross, Jesus, the sinless Christ, dies on the cross. He bridges the gulf between us and God by covering our sin. Mediation. <clears throat> Second word, condemnation. Christ the mediator stands in the place of the condemned. Jesus doesn't just handle our sin. He takes it upon himself as the object of sacrifice. He accepts the place of the guilty in order to exchange to us, his innocence. Third word. <clears throat> Propitiation. It's an important word. You should write it down. Propitiation. A blood debt is owed, legally speaking. The Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. 
So if that's the case, until the price is paid, the condemned, that's you and I, we stand under the justified wrath of God. We can't make the payment because we are morally bankrupt. So at the cross, Jesus makes the payment. Fourth word, justification. Justification means a right standing before God. At the cross, Jesus, with his perfect obedience, culminates in our full pardon. We, for whom there was no justification, are now justified by the life of Christ. Fifth word, imputation, imputation. There is a crediting to accounts both ways. At the cross, at the cross, Christ takes the sin out of our account and puts it in his account as he becomes condemned on the cross. But in doing that, he transfers the innocence out of his account and gives it to us who are guilty so that we stand righteous before God. Culminates in the sixth word. Reconciliation. The gulf is bridged. The wrath of God appeased. The debt we owed canceled. The soul is cleansed. The wide open arms of Christ on the cross revealed to us the means of the father embracing his once lost children. Through the cross of Jesus, God has reconciled us to himself. My plea with any of you today that are not Christians, be reconciled to God through the cross of Jesus Christ. It is the cross of Jesus we remember and we celebrate and I'll point you to. Would you join me as we pray together? <clears throat> and as we pray, we'll say a prayer then I'll ask the deacons to prepare the table. Father, we thank you for your cross. We thank you for the cross of Christ that has purchased sinners. We are redeemed by the blood of Jesus. And I pray that by your spirit, you would apply that to the hearts and minds of men and women and boys and girls here. So be honored now as we remember the sacrifice of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.